Hello, everybody, and good morning. Welcome to another Bible story reading. For those of you joining one of these videos for the first time, I want to let you know what we do here. We go through different stories of the Bible for people who have never heard the stories. Maybe you've only heard bits and pieces of stories, but you don't know all of them. <laughs> so we try to go through these stories and let you get the whole story so that you know um, what they are and how to speak about them intelligently if they come up in conversation. Because a lot of times, preachers often just read one little verse and make a whole sermon out of that. But you don't really get the whole story. Maybe you don't even understand what they just read. So we try to give you things in their entirety. We've been doing a lot of stories out of the Old Testament. And today I wanted to take a little bit of a break. And we're going to go over to Luke 13. For those of you who might be watching this video on YouTube, I want to let you know we go live on Facebook at Get Clear Teachings. You can find us there. But if you are watching this on YouTube, please hit the like and subscribe button. In the meantime, let's jump over to Luke chapter 13. We are going to read this entire chapter. Now, unlike a lot of the other stories that have a whole entire plot to them. We are going to be looking at some teachings of Jesus all through chapter 13. And really, there are a bunch of stories inside of this one chapter. So Jesus is going around in the Galilean, the Galilee region, and he's preaching to people. He's teaching them, and he's, he's actually gotten quite a following of people that want to hear what he has to say. He's teaching them things that they've never heard before, or at least that they've never heard put that way. And we're going to go ahead and start with chapter 13, verse 1. At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he responded to them, Do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or what about those 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed? Do you think they were more sinful than the other people who live in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he replied to him, Sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year. But if not, you can cut it down then. As he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit. For over 18 years, she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hand on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, <coughs> responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to a watering hole? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and what can I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. Again, he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like, like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. 
He went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked him, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. Once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up for us. He will answer you. I don't know you or where you're from. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourself will be thrown out. They will come from east and west, from north and south, to share the banquet in the kingdom of God. Note this, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came and told him, Go, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go tell that fox, Look, I'm driving out demons and performing healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. Yet it is necessary that I travel today, tomorrow, and the next day, because it is not possible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is abandoned to you. I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow, well, that's the end of chapter 13 of Luke. And there's so much in here for us to go ahead and unpack. Remember, there are three ways that we look at these verses and chapters and scriptures and stories when we read them. We look at them and there are these three things. What does it say? We have to have reading comprehension. In other words, you need to be reading the words on the page. You need to know what the words say. Second, what was it saying to the people of the time? We have to take everything into context. We have to understand what was going on. And third, what if anything is it saying to us today? We're going to start from the beginning of 13 and kind of work our way through this to understand what we just read. So at this time, people are following Jesus in Galilee. They're in Galilee and he's he's going to um, he's speaking to them and he's talking to them. And they're they're talking about some things that have happened. They're telling him that there were Galileans, good people, um, Jews, who's who got killed and their blood was mingled with the sacrifice that, um, let's see, what did they say? Whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Okay. And he said, do you think that this happened to them because they were more sinful than other people? Do you think that, um, those people who were helping to do some construction work and got killed, for the Romans, they were, they were doing this for, um, under Pilate and there was an accident and a whole bunch of people got killed. It wasn't just the 18 Jewish people that were working on this, but it was along with some Roman people that got killed as well. He said, so do you think that this happened to them because they were sinners? I'm telling you, unless you repent, you will perish as well. It doesn't matter you know, whether that happened to them because they were a sinner or something else happens. If you're a sinner, you're going to perish. Maybe not because of an accident, but, and we're, we're all, this body is mortal. We know that eventually, unless the Lord comes back, our bodies will eventually die off. But what he was saying to them right there is, look, everybody is a sinner and everybody needs to repent. So he goes on and he tells a story about a man who had a vineyard full of these fig trees. And he says he's going through and he's looking at his, his trees and, and he sees that one of them has not produced fruit for three years. So he tells the, he tells the guy that works for him, he says, just cut it down. That's kind of taking up space. We don't need it. And the guy says, wait, 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 
let me work on it. Let me try to fertilize the soil and see if we can't get this thing to grow. If you come back next year and it still hasn't produced fruit, go ahead and cut it down. Well, when Jesus is teaching this, what he what he is saying here, what he is teaching is this is so much like how God treats us, you know, and, and how Jesus responds to that. God may walk through this earth and see that there are people who are not producing fruit for the kingdom of God, who are not doing things the way God wants them to. And Jesus says, give me, give me one more opportunity to try to see if they will produce fruit. Let me teach them. Let me fertilize them. Let me give them your word and see what happens. Then if they don't obey, if they don't start to produce fruit in their life, then we can go ahead and... and cut them out. So he tells them that they probably don't really understand what they're hearing, but we we know what Jesus was teaching now in hindsight for sure. He goes on, he goes into the temple. It's now the Sabbath day. And the thing about the Sabbath is way back in the Old Testament, Moses, when God had given him the Ten Commandments, one of those commandments was to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And one of the laws was that no work was to be done on the Sabbath, no work whatsoever. In fact, people would prepare their meals the day before. And from sundown on Friday night through Saturday, they were not allowed to do any work. That was considered a period of rest. And God gave that to man so that he wouldn't exhaust himself. But there were certain things that still had to be done. For example, the the oxen still had to have water on the Sabbath day. We, well, I guess you don't get to drink today because it's the Sabbath. And so they would untie the oxen, even though that was considered work. They weren't even supposed to tie other things. They weren't supposed to do anything that was considered work at all. Okay. Well, as he's teaching in the synagogue, here comes this woman. And she's all hunched over and she'd been disabled like that for 18 years of her life. And Jesus looks at her and no doubt has compassion on her and says, woman, straighten up. You're free from this problem that you have. And he puts hands on her and she's healed and she straightens up. Now notice something interesting. The leaders of the synagogue were, they were, they thought they were so important. They were so self-righteous. Look at us. We never do any work on the Sabbath day, but here comes this teacher and he's doing work on the Sabbath. They didn't like him because he was more popular than them and he was speaking the truth. So they complain and Jesus says to them, you guys are hypocrites. If your oxen is tied up on the Sabbath. Don't you untie him and lead him to the water so he can drink? How much more important is this daughter of Abraham? Now that was something they would totally have understood because they knew that they were descendants of Abraham. We have to go way back into the Old Testament. Remember, I tell you that things of the Old Testament always point to the New Testament. Well, that's one of them. He says, how much more important is the daughter of Abraham? Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage that Satan has had her kept in for all of these years, this, this physical bondage that she's been in. So when they heard that they were kind of embarrassed, they were like, Oh man, he just kind of, he kind of mic drop moment. He goes on and he starts telling them this thing about what is the kingdom of heaven? Like, how can I explain that to you? Well, it's like a mustard seed. It's teeny, 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 tiny, but you put it in the ground and it grows and it becomes this, this big giant tree. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is kind of like. It's, it's like just this little thing that just grows and grows and grows. And then he says, it's also like leaven. Leaven is, would be like yeast. You know, if you take a little bit of yeast and you put it into your flour, when you're making bread, the whole loaf rises, right? He says, it's just somebody who took just a little bit of leaven and put it into 50 pounds of flour. And the whole thing was full of leaven. In other words, all of that flour then was full of it. Somebody asked him as he was going through town after town and village after village, these people are following him. And he says, Lord, are only a few people going to get saved? Because although people are following him, other people were not. And Jesus says to him, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. The, the, he says to them, he says, the door in is very narrow. In other parts of scripture, he says, and few find it. So 
And he says, what's going to happen is on that day, only the people who get through that door, once the, once the owner of the house closes the door, it will not matter how many people are standing outside knocking, saying, please let us in. What he's talking about here is at the end of our life or at the end of time when, when God decides that it's time for Jesus to come and, and take his children home, then there will be people who will be standing outside of the heavenly kingdom who are like, we want to come in. We want to come in. Let us in. And the door will have been closed to those people. It will be too late. And Jesus will have said to them, I don't know who you are. I don't know you. Well, you know us. We ate with you. We, you know, we we went to your church. We um, we know your pastor. We um, we watched sermons on television. When we were really in a big jam, we tried to pray to you. And he's going to say, I don't know you. And why will he say that? Because those people had not made him Lord of their lives. They had not followed him all the way to the very end through the door. They decided to get off the path and go wander other places and do other things. At that time, some Pharisees came and told him, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. And I love this. And he said, go tell that fox. He called Herod a fox. He says, look, I'm driving out demons and performing healings today, tomorrow, and the next day. So, you know, he's like, whatever. I'm, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm doing the Lord's work. Then he laments over Jerusalem. He's so sad. You know, Jerusalem was where God established his temple. And it's it's a very important place. And Jesus begins to weep over the people of Jerusalem because he wants them to come to him so badly. God wants, wants them to be in right relationship with him. And he's trying so hard. He's performing miracles. He's, he's healing people. He's loving on them. He's giving them teaching that is straight from his father. And they are rejecting him. And he's saying, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks but you were unwilling. So I really encourage you to start diving into some of these passages yourself and ask yourself, what is God trying to say to me through all of this? What was Jesus saying to me today? You know, maybe there are some of you out there who think that, well, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. He's the real sinner. And Jesus is saying, you're all sinners. You, you still need to repent. Even though they might be doing something that seems worse, you need to repent. You need to start worrying about yourself because there's going to come a time when I'm coming back and I'm going to take my people through that gate to the kingdom of heaven. And you're not going to be with me if you don't repent and stay on the path that I've set for you. So that's just one thing that you could take away from this. I hope you learned something today. I don't know if this was a story of some parables that maybe you had heard before or haven't heard before, but I hope you learned something today. And I look forward to us being together the next time. Have a wonderful day and God bless you.